Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of our Trade Centric University Masterclass Series, Enabling Your Organization for e procurement Growth. Today, our hosts are Kevin Kazenmeyer, Head of Channel Development at Trade Centric, and Amanda Mangiello, Trading Partner Lifecycle Manager at Trade Centric. In this session, you will learn how to one, educate and enable sales and other internal teams to help drive e procurement growth, equip sales with the necessary tools to better engage potential customers and measure value and share success across your organization. But first, I'd like to turn your attention to the third installment of our Trade-Centric Masterclass series scheduled for May 17th, leveraging the right solutions to meet your buyer's needs. With host Kevin Kazemeyer and special guest Joey Wells, Product Support Manager from Volvo. I have dropped a link to register for that session in the chat. As a reminder, you are on mute for the duration of the session. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A function and we will address them at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our hosts, Amanda and Kevin. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by Kevin Kazenmeyer, Head of Channel Development here at TradeCentric. But the real reason Kevin's here today is that he spent the last 20 years in the trenches of today's topic with companies such as Staples, Lowe's, and Granger, focusing on all things e-procurement. And Kevin's really specialized in optimizing these organizations for successful e-procurement growth and adoption. So welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Amanda. I'm so excited to be a part of today's discussion because, as you mentioned, it's been near and dear to my heart for the last 20 plus years. Can't believe I'm saying that. Uh, but enough about me. Let's let's talk about you, Amanda. So Amanda spent the last 10 years working in e-procurement in the supply side, primarily in the life sciences industry. And she really focused on customer onboarding, sales enablement, engagement, and developing and driving the overall e-procurement strategy at companies like Eppendorf and Aptan. So as you can see, this really isn't a sales pitch. This is actual things that we have been doing and successes that we have been living for the last 10, 20 years at companies where we were both doing it on our own and also as most recently as trade center customers. Yeah, it seems pretty crazy how time flies, right? But um, so for those of you who joined us a few weeks ago in our first session, you may remember this chart that we showed at the e-procurement life cycle from discovery through adoption. Uh, last time we really focused on that discovery part, which we went through, you know, how to enable your org um, in terms of setting up the right organization, talking about an overall strategy and goals to set. But today we're really gonna move into that second stage, which is enablement. So this week we'll focus on the enablement part where we'll talk about ensuring that the value of e-procurement is really known across groups internally um, and that they all understand the value. Um, developing educational material and tools to give those groups, and then empowering your sales team to identify the right targets and get ready for growth and adoption. But before you can really drive the program internally, first you need to understand why it matters to different teams in your groups. So we'll talk about a few different groups within your organization today, starting with the sales team. The first thing your sales team really needs to understand is that if your customer has an e-procurement system, this is the way that they've decided they wanna buy, right? They've put a lot of time and effort, research and um, money really into developing these e-procurement systems. So they're gonna do everything they can to make sure that both um, their suppliers and their end users are using the system as much as they can. Last, uh, in our last session, Mary made a comment about if you're not on these platforms, um, you know, you're not gonna be their first call. You're gonna be there or their fifth call, because they're really trying to streamline everything through this single system that they've worked through. Um, and they might make their end users jump through a lot of extra hoops to place non-catalog orders. So that also brings us to market share. If you're not on their platform, your competitor probably is. So something I always used to like to show my sales team that put a little bit of fear into them uh, was show them the, uh, the login screen. Right when you log into a Coupa or a Jagger, you can see all the different logos of all the suppliers that are enabled into their system. 
And it, it really, you know, sent a shiver down their spine when they could see all of their competitors' logos and not their own, because it was really showing them that um, they could click on somebody else other than them, and that sale just got a little bit harder for them. But what do sales team care about more than anything? Their sales number, right? So they're always looking for a way to grow that number, and e-procurement is definitely a way to do that with revenue uplift. Last year, TradeCentric worked with the Hobson Company, um, and we developed an ROI study where we interviewed 15 different suppliers. Most of them were our customers and a few of them real industry leaders. And um, we got some really interesting stats from that study that we'd like to share with you today. So in that study, we found that um, there's a 20% revenue uplift from existing digital um, revenue when we go live with these solutions. So 20% might seem like it's kind of high, but honestly, in my experience, it's right on par. Um, I've used 20% a lot in the past as kind of a conservative number. When we went live with certain different industries, we would see, you know, 30, 40% growth. What about you, Kevin? Is this number something you've seen as well? Yeah. So I, just like you said, I think like when, when you think about 20%, it's really conservative. And if I think about my past, it's probably an understatement, right? Because in when when you started off integrating customers with e-procurement, we saw a growth by 10x of, of existing customer sales. And it actually brings me to an, an interesting point. When you think about this number and how you can grow your existing business, think about where we are today, right? In this, this economy, this recession, this downturn, whatever you want to call it, whatever experts want to say, right? And a lot of the guidance is spend more time growing your existing customers than acquiring new customers. And when you think about what this number represents, well, e-procurement integration, what a better way to grow your existing customers than to get them integrated. Yeah, that's a great point. So another um, group in your organization that e-procurement is really going to have a big impact on is the CS team. So right now your CS group might be fielding a lot of calls looking for, um, you know, pricing or inventory levels, especially inventory levels with the way things have been recently. Um, and that can really take up a lot of their time. But if there's a punch out implemented for them, then they can go ahead and find that information on their own by logging into their punch out. So that's going to save your CS time with those order, um, order questions and calls by people being able to self-serve. But the absolute biggest thing that I saw for my CS team that was absolutely life-changing for everyone um, was when we went live with PO and invoicing, because that really automated the entire purchase order process. They weren't going in and manually placing orders, copy-pasting, or even reading old faxes, which, believe it or not, some people still send. Um, they were able to have our orders come directly into our system. And um, this is another ROI study stat. We found that there's an 80% reduction in order processing um, by doing this. So this is something we found. It went from eight to 10 minutes to place an order to one to two minutes to place an order. Um, and that one to two minutes was really just looking over everything and making sure it looked good before hitting submit. So this is something that was um, a total game changer for our department. We saved tens of thousands of hours just in the first year by doing this. The last group I'm gonna talk about um, that I think gets overlooked a lot is the AR team. So the AR team, of course, everyone wants to get paid you know, in a more timely fashion. They don't wanna be hunting everyone down for invoices, um, but something else that our AR teams are doing that we might not know is logging into portals and manually uploading um, invoices to these portals like a Coupa, like a Jagger. Um, so another stat from the ROI study, found that there's a 75% time reduction for AR managing invoices when it comes to um, putting them in and editing errors um, and integrating here. So 75% seems quite high, but when I spoke with someone in one of my teams in the past, she told me that she spent 17 to 20 hours a week just going into these portals and loading invoices. Kevin, 75%, what do you think of that number? 75% is kind of is important, right? It's it's a big benefit and reduction in time is a big benefit. Um, but I've also experienced even revenue growth when you did invoice integrations, even invoice only integrations. Um, but I don't want to go into that topic because we'll probably cover that on our next webinar on, on May 17th. So I'll, I'll reserve that. And thinking about just time spent, I think about 
you know, when I worked in MRO, um, we had a lot of challenging customers that had payment issues. And sometimes their day sales outstanding would extend well past 60, 90, 120 days, which is really crazy. But what our credit team found out was every time a customer seemed to move to some e-procurement solution, all of a sudden the DSO went way down. And so they started focusing more and more on opportunities where, hey, we have another customer whose credit, you know, their DSO is, is out of line. What can we do? Can we move them to procurement? So we even have the credit team looking to see because they knew what a reduction it was on their time and effort, but also to the company collecting money from our customers. So it's kind of interesting, right? And I think, you know, all these three topics, we have some really good context on, on why it matters. But, you know, Amanda, I guess I would ask you, what, what tools are really needed for this? Yeah, so you understand that there's a value in e procurement, right? That's why you're here today. That's why you implemented these solutions. But how do you get your teams to really understand that? And what tools do you need to do it? So your, your teams may have varying knowledge levels when it comes to e procurement. Maybe they've been selling it for a while. Maybe they've never heard the word punch out catalog. So you have to try to figure out first, you know, where you're at today and then come up with the right tools to get them up to speed. And the more tools that you give them, the more confident they're gonna be when they're having these conversations with their customers. Um, and to do that, we really need to start simple. So we need to start with the basics um, and make sure that everyone is trained properly. And that goes for the existing sales team you have today. So you wanna make sure everyone um, is trained, but don't forget about the new people coming in. So something I used to do with every new salesperson that started is they would spend an hour with me um, as part of onboarding where we would go through what is e-procurement, those basic buzzwords. We would go through the value and make sure that they understand, you know, why it matters to us, why it matters to them, and be aware of all of our processes around e-procurement so that we felt comfortable sending them into the field. They felt comfortable. They weren't going to get in a sticky situation that they didn't know how to talk themselves out of. So that's something that I used to do, um, you know, really important to have training. Kevin, what about you? What have you done for training? Wow. So when I think about it, you know, I worked in office products, MRO, home improvements, three completely different type of, of sales teams, three different approach, three different types of buyers that you're selling to. So really, we had to spend a lot of time in each organization assessing the overall e-commerce competence of our sales team. And then once we were to do that, we did that. We kind of built programs around it. So thinking about office products, it was really an early adopter of e-commerce and e-procurement integration. And it was kind of thrust upon the sales team. You had to know it. It had to be in your tool belt of tools to know how to sell buying online and also how to sell integration. So we built programs and certification programs around it. When you move into the MRO space, again, it wasn't as well known and sometimes it was thought as a black hole. So you had to kind of coach and egg them along a little bit. And so you took on that phone a friend concept of, hey, I have a team that I'm here for you to answer a call if you need it, or I can help you with a call. But you know, you would do the one or two ride alongs and then the third one, you're on your own. You, you try to do this. But what we also did was we put together sales training certifications that went from, you know, the, the account manager all the way up through the DSM and to the, the regional VP level. And everybody was on board. And so after the certifications, the sales managers, the district sales managers would make it part of their weekly one-on-ones to check in with their team to see, hey, how are you doing? Do you have any questions? Can you tell me what customers you spoke to about, you know, e-procurement integration or e-commerce integration? So it was, it was kind of different in each organization to help enable those, those sales teams to really be successful and then really equipping them with all the right marketing collateral. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and, and I think there's so much onboarding, right, for sales teams when they first come on board and they're meeting 100 different people in their first couple of weeks and trying to remember everything that they've been told. So it's really important to have things for them to take away with them as well. That's why I like to give them some kind of a term sheet um, that they can have with them. We have a lot of words in the e-procurement world, right, that um, people are probably not familiar with in their day-to-day. -day. So just having definitions available to them and then also buzzwords that they might hear in the field 
so that even if they forget what that word means, at least maybe they'll think back to the e-procurement team and be able to come and bring you into that conversation. So buzzwords that they can listen to, um, listen for, you know, the, the big ones like e-procurement and CXML, but then also do you, do you hear the word spend management system or do you hear the words um, Jagger, Coupa, Reba? If you're hearing any of these words, um, they at least know that they, they're in the right conversation and they and, uh, bring you into the conversation. On top of those internal documents like that, um, it's also really important to have marketing collateral they can use to show their customers. So Kevin, I think you've, you've done some interesting things with marketing materials in the past if you want to talk about that a little. Yeah, so that's a great point, right? So whether you have a large or small organization, you really need to develop some kind of marketing collateral, some tools to help the sales team. So whether it's like some quick how-to guide, uh, you know, a one, two, three tip sheet, a short video tutorial of like, hey, this is how you get on our site. Um, I've even had success where in the early days in Office products, we called it the two-minute demo. And we did it that way so that the sales team would think that this wasn't really hard. And we kind of gave them a script and then gave them the steps and even the, the marketing collateral to do it on a PowerPoint. So even if they couldn't do it out live on the site, they could show it quickly. Here's a two minute demo on some key features of our site and how we integrate. And that was really helpful. But when you think about, you know, what else is gonna make you successful? I think it's really important to create sort of this one pager of your capabilities. So think about, um, you know, what your offering is, right? And, and you look at what we're showing right now, this is kind of a mock-up that we've done for some of our customers as a recommendation. And you really want to focus on what are your core capabilities? What are your um, needs that your system, that your, your solution is addressing? addressing? What are the capabilities you have? Do you have punch out? Do you have purchase order integration capabilities? Do you have invoice integration capabilities? What are those core e-procurement systems that you hear the most? And having a sheet like this is extremely helpful. It's a great lead behind for customers because even if you're not talking to the right person, that's going to get to the right person. So it's, it's kind of important, right? And you think about when you talk about the section on, on the benefits, you know, Amanda, there are a lot of benefits, but really, like, why do buyers care? Why, what, what do they really care? Yeah, I mean, you've now shown them why they should care and why it's helpful to your organization. But if they're going to go out and sell it, they also need to understand why their buyers care. Um, they put a lot, like I said before, they put a lot into these systems. Why would they go through the pain of that? Uh, and I think every different buyer is going to have a different one of these that's the most important to them. Uh, so, you know, everyone's got a different pain point that really grinds their gears. But I think this is an overall list that most of them would relate to. So you can arm your sales team with a list like this and go through it. You know, it's the basics here, right? We don't want to have any more errors because of manual efforts that have gone in. We want to be able to find our products easily and efficiently. We want everything going through the same channel. But on top of these general e-procurement benefits for buyers, you've put a lot of time and effort into your own e-commerce site. So all of the benefits that you've been using to sell your own online channels can also be used for punch out. So for example, um, you know, in the life science industry, a lot goes into picking out different things that you need for your experiment. So on our site in the past at different companies I've worked for, we've had things like um, additional data sheets and protocols, um, extensive imaging, and even customer review systems where customers could go in and say how a certain thing worked for them. Um, and then you can read that before deciding to use it yourself. So all of those things that we've boasted in our normal website are also translated into the punch out and also become benefits for using that system. Kevin, have you seen any really great e-commerce sites that have been used to sell punch out? Well, it's kind of interesting. I think when you, when you think about this, this particular area of focus, right? you have to start thinking about what are your core strengths? And then how can you put that all together and present it to a buyer that shows them, here's the value that I present, right? So I think about you know stuff that I've done in the past that has been really successful. And it's been that kind of solution feature needs-based document. So, hey, you know I have the ability to create shopping lists on my site and here's what the benefit is to you. I have the ability to bring in our managed inventory on the site, and here's the benefit to you on how you can reorder. 
and connecting those. The things like you just said, right? Being able to look at the data sheets, being able to look at CAD drawings. What are those core capabilities that you have? I mean, I have an example of, of someone that I worked with from my in my previous role um, at a marketplace company where their site had an amazing feature. And it basically was enter the equipment that is in your kitchen. So they sold to companies that industrial kitchens, fast food companies, right? You entered all of your equipment into this list. And based on the make and model number, they were able to display to you every product that they sold that fit that machine. So think about how easy that makes it for the user to now find a widget that broke and up, oh, I need a something for the, for the fryer. And all of a sudden I bring up my fryer and there's the widget I'm looking for. And now I place that order and I'm done. That is huge, right? But when I asked them, like, what was the adoption on that particular feature? They were like, oh yeah, we, we don't really talk about it that much. We don't sell it that much. And when we kind of raised up like why that was important and how that was essential to buyers and for them to be able to, you know, I'm working in a kitchen. I don't want to be spending all my time ordering. I want to be in and be out. So when you were able to raise that up and show to them that you need to start tracking your conversion rates on, on that type of feature, and then you need to shout from the rooftops on the feature. So what I would say to everybody on the call is if you have those unique features, you know what makes you different. You should be adding that into your your a marketing collateral into how you present to your customers into talking about your e-procurement capabilities because that's part of your strengths and basically you know you know your strengths now now you have to know your audience yeah it's true and <clears throat> i think a lot of companies have put a lot of effort into figuring out who their audience is and they do a lot of work on personas but the persona work that I've seen um, in my experience has mostly been on different kinds of customers, different kinds of industries, and trying to figure out who, who's buying their products um, from an overall company perspective. But not a lot of work that I've seen has gone into looking at personas within an individual company. So it, every person that you're talking to um, throughout your selling journey is a little bit different within that company. And here we've got a few different personas that I'll talk through in a minute, but before I go into them, um, Kevin, you've mentioned to me a few times a persona that you've seen in the past. It's a little outdated if you want to share um, what that was. Yeah, yeah. And and with all due respect, I think I think about a time, you know, many years ago at a, at a company that I went to where um, the persona was uh, Alan Betty. And basically, they were a field worker, a maintenance worker, and a procurement person. And that's how everything was built around. And we were trying to understand why we weren't as successful in selling e-commerce and e-procurement to these companies, because those are the two personas that the company was built on. And it was important then. But as you get into the digital age, you have to take a step back and you have to say, there are so many more people involved. Your, your personas really need to be industry specific. And they have to focus on the roles that you're you're working with, right? I mean, think about today, there's been so much change and, and roles have changed and organizations have shrunk. And, you know, you really need to analyze the role and its core functions that are related to you and how they buy from you. You think about in many organizations, many users even consider themselves purchasers, right? E-procurement allows everybody to be a purchaser. And I think about this, Amanda, that there's, there's probably no better example of where a purchaser can be anybody in an organization than in a life sciences industry where, you know, somebody in the lab, a doctor or scientist may need to order. They could order at any time and, and you really know how to do, how to address them. Yeah, it's so true. And, and they have different goals. So that's kind of this field-based user that we're talking about. And I have sales teams. I work with a lot of sales teams who aren't always working with the heads of procurement, but they're going lab to lab every day and they're talking to the people who are really doing the, the research. Um, and those people, to them, their goal is to get their product as fast as possible. They don't want to hold up their, their work they're doing. Um, you know, every day that they put things on hold is grant money going to waste. They really just want to make sure I get exactly what I need and I get it in the time that I need it. So they're logging in and um, 
you know, placing orders, but they're not going to have the same knowledge about their systems as someone like a buyer or the AP manager or a procurement officer. Um, so we have really different questions that we're going to ask someone like that than the questions we're going to ask um, those purchasing groups. And I think it's really important to arm your sales team with the right kinds of questions for the right type of end user. So if you're talking to end users here, they might not know that they use Coupa. They might not know that they use Ariba, but they might know that they do log into something before placing an order. So doing some of these probing questions can at least figure out if it's worth continuing the conversation and maybe getting to the next level. So is it easier to order from other suppliers from us? Um, you know, do you submit any requests for orders? Basically trying to figure out what their buying journey is um, and if it's something that you could streamline by being involved with them more closely with their procurement group. And then the real goal here, if you can, is to get them to introduce you to a purchasing contact. Um, having an advocate and an end user is always helpful in a purchasing conversation. And then once you do get to that purchasing conversation, um, there's a different set of questions you can ask there. So when you start talking to procurement, you know, this is the team that's really going to know what's going on. They're the ones who are in those e-procurement systems every day. Um, it's a big part of their role to make sure that things are running smoothly in there. So that's where you can really start to um, ask more detailed questions. Uh, you can talk about different requirements with them uh, and see, see. Um, how do you process invoices? How do you have direct catalog set up with similar suppliers? Those are some important questions to start so, with. So, sure. and, and, and actually, Amanda, if I can interrupt, I mean, you think about yeah. these questions, right? All these questions, they really will help you drive your own requirements document, right? Not only are you getting to the right persona, but also to the right requirements. And those right requirements are gonna be what's necessary to help drive successful integration and adoption. Yeah, and, and when you're getting those requirements down, I think you also need to think about what level do you want your sales team to go in there? Are you really wanting them to get all the technical details? Do you think that they have that maturity level? Or are you trying to ask some of these basic questions and then they can turn it over to maybe an e-procurement team to ask more specific questions? So on these questions here, you know, we've gone through them for end users, for procurement. Kevin, are there any questions that you see that are missing that you found really useful? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I, I um, liken this one to the fact that I've been around probably way too long and started in office products where, as I mentioned earlier, we were involved in pretty much every e-procurement implementation from the start. You know, every company wanted to have as much buyer adoption as possible. So what product touched every user, but office supplies. And what I noticed was as I moved on to other industries and other companies, I found that the answer to this question led me to success many, many times. And that question was, how do you order your office supplies? Because if I found out how they're ordering their office supplies, I would know if they had any procurement solution. And then if I found out how they're ordering their office supplies, I would say, well, how do you pay for your office supplies? And then I would find out if there was an invoicing option as well. And again, I mean, when you think about it, that's pretty much how this e-procurement space was built, like office products with a cornerstone. And it's kind of a safe question to ask because everybody still needs office supplies. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's probably not someone who's talking to, you know, someone in a lab's first thought to ask about office supplies, and you might confuse them for a minute, but once once you start going down that road, it'll click with them and say, oh, yeah, okay, we do that. That makes sense. So, um, so you know, Amanda, if I can interrupt, yeah. I, have, I have something else, too, on that, right? I, I think about uh, one of my recent roles where we were trying to train the organization on what e-procurement meant, and we had an internal tool called spend management and everybody would hear the term e-procurement and they were just like, I don't understand this e-procurement. I don't know what punch out is. And then we would say, well, how do you buy the supplies for your store? They go, I use spend management. Do you know spend management utilizes punch out? No way. And it was just little connections like that. So I'm sure even in your organizations, you have procurement that you could go to and say, well, how do we buy our supplies today? 
and even ask them that simple question, right? And find out what those answers are from your own procurement department. Yeah, I think anytime you can put something in relatable is always going to help. Any anytime you have extra stories, which which kind of actually brings us to our next point where we're talking about, um, you know, you, you've shown them all of this information, you've given them training, you've given them buzzword sheets and questions to ask, and you know, benefits of e procurement. But right now, it's all talk, right? They're just taking your word for it that this is important. And to get them to really care, you've got to show them some proof. So when you're showing them proof, you want to talk about really successful stories that you've seen. And um, when they see other people being successful in something, they're going to want to share in that success too. They want to try something that's tried and true. So think about different things that you've seen during your integrations. Have you seen you know, revenue growth with the catalog? Or are there products that maybe weren't being purchased as much by a customer, but once you went live, you saw them go up? Do you have new opportunities being offered to you because of these capabilities? So something that I've seen um, is in the university space, especially, is that when I've looked to do RFPs, um, we've lost those RFPs because we didn't have the right capabilities to meet them where they were at. Um, we lost an RFP and a few years later, we went for that same RFP with a new set of capabilities and we were awarded the contract. We became a preferred supplier and we were able to um, have a punch out and really saw great revenue growth. Another thing um, that was really successful and, and helped show that to our team, there was a bunch of small biotechs that we were really struggling to get into, but those biotechs purchased together. And once we were able to get in with that purchasing group and we got on their e-procurement platform, our logo was there right when they logged in. And all of a sudden we saw sales double, triple, 150% growth in the first couple months that we went live with that catalog and access to a whole set of users that we didn't have access to before because they were really closed spaces. You couldn't just walk around and, and walk into the labs without badge access. So that sales rep was just so excited that we now had all of these contacts, all of this information coming in on the orders and um, really just free advertising on their homepage by having a punch out catalog. And when our other, uh, you know, when our other sales team saw that, they started to get a little jealous and wanted to figure out how they could do that too. Those are some of the things I've seen, Kevin. I, we've we've talked about a, a good number of years here. I'm I'm sure you've got your own stories you've seen over the the time too. Yeah. So you think about a lot of the business case examples that we're showing here, right? And 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 a lot of them are all from actual um, customer successes, right? And I think within each of your organizations, you could probably dig in and, and find some of these successes so that, again, you can help sell the business case to your sales team. So, I mean, I started off talking at this one at the top, and this was something that really drove success in, you know, in the MRO space was showing the amount of sales increase, you know, four to 12x sales increase after implementing punch out solution. And a lot of it is really based on seeing your price, seeing availability. And then you think about, you know, the catalog growth on the next one. Well, that's also was a benefit of, again, the industry that I was in, because so many customers think about you for one group of products or one product assortment, and they don't realize what your full assortment is, or maybe they didn't know their, their price. So now that they can see everything and they can buy everything, well, now you're expanding your, your product assortment that you're now selling to them. And so to be able to report on that and show them how you've done new non-catalog sales and product expansion because of showing up on their punch out and having the users being able to, to buy any of these products at any time. And then finally, you think about new locations that, that may be ordering. So again, Amanda talked early on about logging in and seeing that whole board of supplier logos and who am I, I punching out to? Well, every location that now has access to the e-procurement system now sees your logo. And now they click on it and they can start buying from you. And to be able to then show them the sales lift and the new ship to sales of locations you never had before is again, just another big thing to, to help with the business case to show them proof. But you know, we show them the proof, but what do you have to do? We have to show them the money. And, you know, we all heard the phrase that money talks. And really, that sales them up, right? That's how they go to market. That's how they get paid. They want to see how it's going to impact them. 
Well, what I found is that the best way to incentivize your sales team is to make sure that the goals start at the top. So in any organization I had, I was in, we had our senior levels, our C-suite all endorse what we wanted to do from a goal as a percentage of e-commerce e-procurement sales throughout the company. You know, when I think about an office products, you started off with very little, we were new, we were out of the gate. Hey, could we get to 20% of sales? Then all of a sudden, when you saw it was 20% and then people started to get on board and like, hey, let's see if we can get to 30%. And then next thing you know, there's a big company initiative and we're going, hey, let's hit the drive for 55. And you're now getting more and more people on board. But then how do you get them on board and how do you keep them going? Well, maybe you're holding a contest. Maybe you're giving them some kind of gift card for who closes the most number of e-procurement deals or creating a spit for each new win. Or maybe it's even now company-wide where those numbers are now factored in their annual performance goals. You know, So I think about how we matured through office products. Towards the end, when I was there, E-commerce goals were part of every sales rep's annual performance. And in the MRO space, some people got to go to the annual achievers, the president's club, and do all that because they had great growth in, in their e-procurement integration. So these are just some ideas to think about and, and you know about basically how I've had success incentivizing those sales teams, getting them on board. Once you've equipped them with everything that we've been discussing so far today, I think like this is really the, the the cap of it all to like bring it to the sales team to say, okay, now we want you to do it. And, you know, you may get some resistance still, you may have to handhold for a few times, but you're going to see that when you start to implement a lot of these things, you're going to see your e-procurement numbers start to really grow. So, you know, we've covered a lot so far today and, you know, Knowing the value e-procurement brings to your organization is, is really key. And the tools and the materials that are necessary. Um, and then, you know, in this last section, really finally how to empower and incent not only the sales team, but the rest of your organization to help you with targeting adoption, targeting customers. You know, you can have anybody come to you at any time and be like, I think this is a candidate because they do X or they perform Y and this is how they would fit. This is how we could help solve their, their needs. So that's what we have for today for right now. I think um, now's a good time, Amanda. We should probably open it up for questions. So as we mentioned earlier, if you have a question, please send it in on the Q&A. Um, we've had some questions come in while we've been talking. So um, I'm going to just pick them off one by one, and whoever they're addressed to, we'll start uh, answering them now. So, Amanda, first question I see here is, how do you reduce customers who wish to use manual channels for ordering, such as fax and email? Yeah, those are always a problem, aren't they? And you wouldn't believe how many still send Facts is what blows my mind. But I think the first thing to do there would be to figure out what their process is. Um, why are they sending them that way? Do they have any procurement system? And I think once you start to break down that process and why they're doing it that way, you can start to show them the pain points of it, start to show them um, why that's not the best way. So have they seen errors in their invoices when they send them this way? Are they... Um, you know, is it taking longer to get their invoices from their suppliers? Should they be, it could be more automated. Um, and once you start showing them those flaws in their current system, it's easier to demonstrate the benefits of how it could be a lot faster and easier for them. That's great. I mean, and, you know, I actually also had a little bit for that as well. And what I saw um, was that if you incentivize them too, there's uh, some additional ways to get them to, to move off of these, these manual channels. So you know how good and how important it is to, to move someone off some an old method, a manual offline method to an online and integrated method. So why not share in that with your customer? And what we used to do was we would throw them out, um, whether it was like a half a percentage point or a percentage point, depending upon the the total percentage of sales they got to um, from an integrated perspective. 
over a year or maybe two years. So let's just say, you know, they were a large customer and we would say, if you could hit 50% of your orders coming through this new integration method, we'll give you a, a half percent rebate back at the end of the year. Or again, maybe we'll extend some of these items that we, we guaranteed on contract pricing for three more months, what, whatever you want to do, but incentivizing the customer a little bit that way, we felt really helped drive the adoption. And once you got them in and adopted, then you knew you were going to have them because you were providing them the solutions they needed to meet their needs. That's good. All right. <clears throat> so a uh, question for you, Amanda, in your previous companies, how did you incorporate e-procurement into your overall organization strategy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think just making sure that you have a strategy, I, I come across a lot of teams that, that don't really have a strategy. They're just saying they're keeping their head above water. But I think if you have it right, you have, always have a sales strategy, you have a marketing strategy. It's important to keep your e-procurement strategy as fresh as those other strategies. So revisit it every quarter, revisit it every year um, and change it. So you want to have goals associated with it too. How many um, integrations do you want to try to get live this year? What kind of revenue uplift are you trying to see? And, and when you have some goals to, to hold yourself to, I think that really helps drive the strategy and make sure that you're, you're doing the best you can to push it forward. You know, are there new capabilities you've heard um, that some of your competitors have that you don't have? So try to keep yourself on your toes with your strategy and be, be stretching your push goals every every quarter, every year. Excellent. All right. So here's one for me. And it's actually a pretty good question, too. Um, what do you do if your buyer tells you your spend is too low to be integrated? Um, really interesting, right? So. I, I, we actually have uh, a couple of our current customers that, that have this, this challenge as well, too. And I think about, you know, the first thing I've done is understand that buyer's goals for their implementation. So they've paid all this money for an e-procurement system. What are they trying to get at? What are those goals? Is it the number of suppliers? Is it the total spend? Is there some sort of automation goal? Basically, those goals are really going to help you drive how to position your solution to help achieve those goals. So, yeah, maybe they may say, well, your spend is too low. And maybe you find out that there's some opportunity for you to grow your product line or grow another product line. Or maybe they don't have everything that you're offering from another supplier who's incapable of integrating. Right. So it's asking those questions and find out, well, who else do you have on your your platform? Is your intent to automate all of your spend? I mean, I look at some of the buyers that I've been speaking to and, and I, I have the, the pleasure this week of being at the Coupa conference. So getting to speak to a lot of buyers, many buyers here are tasked with automation of their entire processes, bringing as much spend as they can into Coupa under that automation and then addressing all of the manual invoices that process outside the system. So if you think about that, you know, you can find out your buyer's pain points and find a way to address that your spend is too low comment. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, let's go to Amanda. Here's another one. We prefer punch out, but some customers insist on having hosted catalogs and the maintenance updating process is much more difficult than punch outs. I know you talked about creating a comparison, but can you share specific examples where you had success, success convincing customers to go with punch out over hosted? It's a really good one. That is a good one. And something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, when I was talking about those goals for strategy, you know, it wasn't just about integrations, but I've even had goals for our team that was converting hosted to punch out because they were such a pain for us to, to update. Um, and I, th I think there's two different ways I've gone, gone about it in the past. Part of it being pointing out the flaws of one while bringing up the benefits of the other. So I think any time we've had any challenges or unhappy e-procurement customers, they've all really been hosted, right? So it's a static catalog. And as soon as you upload that catalog, it's outdated. If you've got any new products, if you've got any new pricing, 
um, it's outdated until the next time. So you're still going to have customers needing to call in and figure out, um, do I even have the right pricing, getting rejected orders. So that's not a great experience for them. So try to see if they've had any of those struggles, see if they're calling in to find inventory and point out those pain points. Um, I guess there are still them that cling onto it really hard because they think they have more visibility, but I would demonstrate all those benefits of your e-commerce site and show them the, the real um, benefits you have there. You have all your stock right in, on hand. You've got all these different things to make sure that your buyers are buying the right product. So they're not, you know, going on a hundred character description and trying to hope so. And um, Kevin, I'm thinking back to that story you told about that parts tool. I mean, how great is that compared to a giant Excel sheet of numbers and I'm sure very technical descriptions of parts where they probably don't mean anything to a lot of people. But if you've built these great tools within your punch out, I think you really got to demonstrate them and bring them up. Yeah, I mean, and, and I found that the, the question I would ask to the customer would be, so I'm pretty much the expert of my products. I built my search around solving needs for people like you. Is the searching tool that you're asking me to put my catalog into going to do the same thing? And when the people realize the pain point that's involved with that and the challenges, you, you get some movement there and you, oh, okay, I didn't realize that I was going to lose all these capabilities or not be able to search the way I am used to searching on your website. So um, that's another thing that, I've, that I could add to that one. Um, here's another good question. We have clients that request punch outs and then wind up not using them much. Should we try to get the customer to commit to a specific spend beforehand or is that not realistic? Um, boy, we can go in many directions with this one. And, and I'll start, Amanda, and I'll let you address it. Uh, so I never had a minimum threshold at any place that I was at. And the reason why I never had a minimum threshold was because I was confident that once we got integrated and once I built the program and handed it off to my sales team and told them what to do, that we could drive adoption and we could drive sales growth. And I actually have a customer that I worked with extensively at, at one of the companies that I was at. And, you know, it sounds like it's a lot, right? I mean, they were a $15 million global company, global customer for us. And they were implementing PeopleSoft procurement. And PeopleSoft was really challenging. And, you know, you say, well, hey, how does that fit a minimum? There was a lot of work and there was a lot of effort that needed to be done. And nobody in this company wanted to buy on PeopleSoft. But once we did the integration and went around and talked to all the people in the plants and did training and handed out material and showed them how great and easy it was going to be, within 18 months, that $15 million account grew to $21 million, which is phenomenal, right? But we also would take $10,000 a month accounts and grow them to $100,000 a month. So I, I, I would say that sometimes it's specific to your business. It's specific to what's your overhead, right? And what you're willing to spend and what, what you're willing to sacrifice to at a minimum. You know, we just had some, some recent conversations with, with customers that have said, I have a minimum. I have a specific minimum before I will integrate that customer but I know that I'm going to get growth out of it. And I've had others that'll say, I don't have a minimum because I know the value and the savings I'm bringing to them and eventually they will grow. So I know that's kind of a long-winded answer, but Amanda, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, this could probably be its own webinar topic itself, <laughs> talking about um, adoption here, but I have had thresholds in the past where I've said I won't integrate unless you have this amount of money. And I, I ended up moving away from that over time because I felt like I was leaving room for potential off the table. Um, and there were some small companies that your sales team might know better than you, um, you know, what their potential is. And if they're going to grow, you could grow with them. So maybe they're, you know, a 10 person company today, they could be a thousand person company, 10,000 person company eventually if they, if they have the right um, team. But I, I think it's really about knowing, I, I'm not sure if the question is just about 
how much spend in general, or that only a small percentage of the spend is through the punch out of the overall spend. So if it is that small percentage one, I think having a launch plan is really important and making sure that the end users know that you're on their system. So they've been buying from you a certain way. Um, somebody's got to tell them that there's a new better way, whether that's a campaign, an email campaign that you can send out. I've had a lot of success um, making relationships with purchasing contacts who might have a newsletter that goes out every month and maybe you could get a section of that newsletter. Uh, I've seen some that have intranets on their sites that they could put your logo or an announcement up on. Um, and I wouldn't do it just once. So in a couple months, maybe make a second version with a few benefits in your punch out, the, a reason for them to go there. Um, did a new discount come with that punch out? So anything that's exciting and, and driving them there, once you get them there once, they're more likely to go back there again, I think. Um, but yeah, really try to utilize your tools and utilize your procurement partners because they are more likely to open an email from their purchasing group than from you, realistically. All right, so here's another one, and it's kind of similar to that topic. What you how you just were finishing, and you know, it says it's 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 addressed to me. So it was, are there any available videos or material that can be used to show my customers on how punch out works? And so I'll actually save the second part of how it works because I I have a little tip at the end that I want to share, and I think that may be helpful for you. But I think about videos or or online material. Um, we've been building, Amanda and I have kind of been building this little database of recommended tools. And what I would say is we'll equip your CSMs with this information. And if you haven't seen it yet, we launched a video on tradecentric.com on kind of what our solutions are, but it shows the entire experience punch out what happens user, what happens on the supplier side and how the documents are exchanged. I think it's really interesting for you to take a look at that too. And you can help use that to leverage that with your sales team just so that they get a base understanding. Um, but we will definitely give that to our CSM team to help you know with anybody that wants to see it. Because um, again, it's just stuff that we've had that we've been successful with. And it's kind of like templates that you could leverage for your own adoption and driving success. Uh, next question coming in, it's not addressed to either of us, but um, I'll, I'll take the first shot at this, Amanda, because I think we both had different organizations when we approached this. And then you can give me your, exa your, your experience, but is it pretty common for organizations to hire someone on their team to lead e-procurement integrations for each customer, such as an integration specialist, or is it more of an IT or sales function? That is a great, great question. So we've actually been developing a strategy workshop for our customers on how, how to build the right organization and what does that look like? And didn't want to have to dive into that into this webinar because you know you start to think about how different each of our orgs are. You really have to weigh in the size of the company, the size of your sales team, the way that you've integrated your commerce system and your uh, reliance on your IT team or your self-service capabilities of someone else to be able to go in and create credentials. So if I think about the three main companies that I was at, I was all there as part of a, like this in-between team between the sales team, the tech team, and our customers. And we help right along with sales team to coach them on opportunities, to identify opportunities. We went with customers to, to talk about our capabilities and to try to close them. We gathered requirements for the integration. And for the first two companies where we did it on our own, we handed it off to an IT team to build the, the connections and mapping. And then it came back to myself and my team to work with our sales team to drive adoption. If I think about my late last one as a trade center customer, it was we went and hired specific people to do that task to kind of be that liaison between trade centric for the requirements and the customer for the requirements, but still leverage the sales team for growth. Man, anything to add? I know we're running a little short on time. Yeah, um, I, I've been in orgs with big sales team, small sales team, no sales team. Um, and I've been part of the marketing team as any procurement person. I've been part of the sales team and there's been some people in IT. So it's really different between the orgs, but I think as long as you have someone who could sit, I think there has to be someone who has a little bit of a commercial mindset, 
who at least can be that liaison to the customer or liaison to your sales team, um, and then understand enough about e-procurement to kind of be that subject matter expert to jump into conversations. Um, and whether that person does the testing and integrations or you have a separate person, I've, I've been in both situations, but I think it's really important to have someone who understands everything from the technical perspective where maybe they're not setting up the catalog, but they can at least do test orders and, and have a, a solid understanding of that. Um, but also understands the, the value, the, um, you know, how to find the right customer and, and work with the sales team on that. So I've, I've been in a, a few different orgs that have done it differently, but I think those two main things, having a, a technical and a, a business minded person are important to have. Great. Thanks. So I would say as a follow-up to that, if you're interested in doing any follow-up with Amanda or myself, work with your customer success manager and we can, you know, go through in more depth in some of these organizational specific best practices. But I want to thank everyone for all your questions. There is a ton more. I'm I'm really excited about all the, the level of questions that have come in. So we will definitely get to all of them. We will post all the answers in part of our follow-up so that you have them. But I just want to take the last couple of minutes to get to our, our tip of the month. And our tip of the month is something that I hope everybody's aware of, but you may not be aware of all the benefits of our business intelligence portal. So I'm sure you were introduced to it initially when, you know, from an integration side, it was showing you visibility to all the solutions. It was allowing you to see the transactions and the sessions. But as I mentioned earlier on that one question, did you know that it is a punch out emulator and it allows you to do demonstrations? So you have demo capabilities in the portal, you can actually go and log in and demonstrate your punch out site to customers through portal. And it's really a great tool to do that, to go punch out and return cart and see everything. But the biggest benefit and the biggest piece that I feel is, is underutilized in portal is the reporting and analytics. And I just want to call attention to some key reporting and analytics tools that Amanda and I have both used as trade centric customers. And really, these reports allow you to gain access to not only account overviews, but solution specific. Okay. So think about punch out. You want to, you launch punch out. You want to know the success rates. Are people having trouble? What is, what is the, the uh, conversion rates like? We have the ability to show you conversion rates on punch out by overall view, by customer view, by day view. You can slice and dice this in many ways. You can see how many abandoned carts were left out there. And then if you think about from an adoption perspective, you have exportable format. So looking at that middle Excel sheet, there's a person's name on this report that appears 12 times over the course of a month. So my first thought would be, I need to call her up and I need to say, are you having trouble with our punch out? Is there something I can do for you? Maybe you need some extra training because... I, I see that you're punching out, but you're never returning your card, right? You know, and maybe I don't have to tell them that I see that, but at least you can talk to them and see, maybe this user needs some help. Maybe your sales team can reach out to them and, and talk to them about, you know, what is the challenge with, with ordering on your punch out site? And then the last one is all around the PO and invoice volumes and, and seeing it by time of day, by day of the week. And you can track your patterns and see how different it is by industry to know what are your busy days? What are your light days? What can you expect? And I've even been told that some of our customers have used this to determine what's the best time to set down times. So again, if you need any more information on this, if you haven't dived into reporting and analytics, again, reach out to your CSM. Really important. It's a great tool. Um, one final reminder is, again, we mentioned it at the top. Our next session, I hope you can join us. We are going to be covering leveraging the right solutions to meet your buyer's needs. I know there were questions in the chat about invoices, how to handle invoice, how to handle some invoice challenges. This is the session where we're going to be covering solutions outside the normal punch out and PO. So if you think about advanced ship notices, order acknowledgements and invoicing and how you can be successful with those and work with your, your buyers on driving success. So I really... We, we put that chat link in there to register. I look forward to seeing you there and hope that you'll register. And really, I want to thank everybody again for joining today. 
and hope you have a great day. Thank you all, and that is the conclusion of our webinar.